Today we're going to talk about one art. And I always enjoy the beginning of a project. Because this is the beginning. We're going to solve the mystery of this one artifact. Uh, and it, it all began when Jason Lovett, um, uh, who will join me in a moment on the stage here, come up, Jason, and uh, make sure everyone uh, sees you. They, Jason's the kind of person we would hope um, picks up the trowel. But Jason is a school teacher up in Newfane, Vermont. Is that right? That's right. And uh, he's also a, a, an extremely responsible uh, and accomplished and academically oriented metal detectorist. I know among many people that somehow raises poor images, but I always found the metal detection device to be just another detecting instrument. My trowel is pretty good, too. I find a lot with my trowel. But it, it is a great uh, the use of the metal detector. And I know years ago I had done a Revolutionary War fork in the state, state of Ohio. Oh, we had sieved the deposits, and yes, we thought we'd done good work, and there was our big mound of back dirt, and the metal detectorist club came out one day, and they said, Dr. Gramley, um, we'd like to help you, but um, I said, well, you know, there's this back dirt pile, but I don't think you'll find anything in it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when they handed me seven USA buttons, <laughs> and these are among the oldest of the USA buttons, many of them fragmentary, I must admit, but still, oh, yes, and that opened my eyes to the, to the utility. So Jason has made a number of early finds or uh, coinages and other things in places that you would least expect. But one day, tell it in your own words. Well, I was uh, metal detecting in the Northampton Meadows in a freshly turned over potato field. It was a dry, dusty day last October. And right on top, right in the middle of the plow zone, right in the middle of the plow zone, this is on. I'll just project a little bit more. He'll bring it up. Bring it up. Oh, all right. There we go. Stand forward. So, I was walking along, scanning as I usually do, eyes on the ground, and about five feet in front of me, I spotted this focus point. And my metal detector is very near and dear to my heart. I can clutch that thing all the time. It's my baby. I chucked it aside, <laughs> went dropped down to my knees, picked up this point because I knew exactly what it was. And it was the most exciting moment of my life, just picking this point up off the ground, knowing that nobody else had seen it for almost 13,000 years. And being able to share it with you guys, being able to share it with Dr. Gramley, it's, it's really important to me. And I really appreciate you letting me come up here and share the story. Yeah, uh, yeah let's keep the right hand for a moment. Well, I think this is all made of rounds. Is that not so? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We didn't see it. Oh, you haven't seen it yet? Okay, take, take her to that lady. Just let her hang on to it. Now, prior to um, the discovery of that artifact, uh, New England was, has been generally regarded as a sort of a Johnny come lately place, even though, as I told you, to go back to Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley, there is an inclination on their part. Uh, to believe uh, that there may be a Salutrian vestige or two in the coastal areas or northern areas of New England. Uh, but basically, most people have argued uh, that there is no real full-blown Clovis, such a 13,000-year-old Clovis, and such as you would find in Arizona or Texas or anywhere else that's been radiocarbon dated. And I've known differently. I know of an excellent uh, Clovis site at Monsungan Lake, Maine, which has been ignored, and a few other things. And I've always smarted 
um, at that uh, assertion. I've seen maps of uh, North America that are colored green, but New England is colored yellow. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a later place where it's somehow less significant because of it, where events transpired at a later time. Yes, we have the Vale site, which is around 12,700 years old. And, and, and we have one or two other things that are nearly equal antiquity, but still people can very comfortably uh, maintain the position that whatever happened here was late and maybe of no real importance. So that's why this point of Jason's uh, was a welcome to me. Uh, I, I saw the point, what I saw in that point was uh, Colton's points are made by two primary pathways. The first and most commonly practiced is to take a spot or a flake, thin one, and reduce it to the finished form. The other pathway is to take a pre-existing biface, maybe a big knife or a hoe or a, an axe, and then somehow snap it down into a smaller piece and then reduce that. And always this points made by the second pathway have flaking removals that betray their initial origin as something else. Jason's point was made by the second pathway. And the second pathway was frequently followed on sites in Kentucky and Texas. So that is a real Clovis point. In fact, it's a variety that we call the Ross County variety, named for Ross County, Ohio, where it was first recognized. Many people thought it was somehow typologically or rather chronologically different than other more typical Clovis points. But it's not, just another way of making it. In any case, to finally have a point that we can single out and say, here is a Clovis point. Now, put up your dukes. Uh, it's important uh, so that we don't uh, have to suffer the, uh, the, low, the attitude that we, we do from people who come from the American West, where they think Clovis began. And uh, as I told you, and I didn't mean to be at all, if I wasn't over, really being too fierce, but I, I have to say that Clovis manifestations in the West, although there are a few large sites, are really quite minor compared to what we know east of the Mississippi. That's the perspective. In any case, Jason's point, what does it stand for? What really uh, is, what does it mean? And I have given you here uh, four alternate hypotheses about what this point might mean. And uh, the one that I like, because I dug the mail site, um, is that it was a perfect point, maybe kept for a while by the son or the descendant or the daughter of the person who had used it and made it. And it was left as a memorial uh, to some important event that took place there. Now up at the Vale site, uh, we had the great fortune to discover 600 feet west of the habitation site, upwind of the habitation site, and on the other side of an ancient channel of the river that flowed there when the site was lived at, we found a killing site, killing ground. We found 12 fluted points, four, uh, five were intact, and uh, eight were broken. We fitted seven of the tips to bases back at the habitation site. We have one tip yet to fit back, and I think I know where I'll find the base. It's still in a place on the site. But the ones that weren't uh, broken in half, among those, there was one exquisitely perfect yellow jasper fluted point. It was the only perfect, unresharpened point that we dug up at the entire Vale site. We found nearly 200, getting on to 200 
fluted points of that site fluted things. And this was the only perfect point. You know, there are a lot of perfect points out there, Clovis points. They're all fake for the most part. People can make them as good as the Clovis could. They're crafty people who make a living uh, stealing from people. And they're out there. There are too many of them. I have just given you the statistic of what to expect. Now, at the Vail site, we had 20-some complete points. Yes, not broken, but they were reworked, all of them, and had been reduced in size. But this one, the yellow jasper one, left at the kill site, was pristine. I have a feeling, it's only a feeling, that when that kill site the significance of that site was realized and how the band of 35 to 50 Clovis people were going to have good living for the next seven or eight or nine or ten years that they lived there, that was left intentionally. Maybe it was made by grandpa, maybe it was made by dad, a person who was no longer there, but it was left there. This idea of leaving perfect projectile points I might add, is commonly seen in the American West on bison kill sites. You'll find these broken projectile points that have been shot into the buffalo, one after the other, but sometimes by a post hole where a stake once stood, there'll be one exquisite piece left there. So I think the analogy, and that's the thing I like to argue, is that perhaps Jason's point marks a kill site. And that when we, now, if it does, there's got to be an associated habitation site. Downwind, if we use the analogy of the Vail site. So if we go back to Jason's fine spot, and if it were a kill site, what would we find? We'd only find projectile points. No debitage, no scrapers, no gravers, no habitation debris. We just find broken and perfect points, or complete points. So that's what it might be. And I'm a romantic to a certain extent, so I like to think that's what it will be. But that's my preferred, but not necessarily correct idea. The, um, so that's by analogy to the veil side. The second thing it might be, Again, based on archaeological reality, not pie-in-the-sky theorizing, is that it could be a burial cache. The bones, long gone. They'll never endure that stone and that soil. They're, they'll be gone quickly. But the artifacts might. In New York State years ago, I heard tell about a base of Clovis Point that had gotten found by a farmer. And it was made of Knife River, North Dakota flint. Still is the most extreme example of raw material movement in the entire Paleo-American archaeological record, in my opinion. Uh, and as the crow flies, it's a good many, many hundred miles between Buffalo, New York, uh, and uh, the sources of this stone, Knife River stone in the Dakotas. But in any case, this got found, and it was the base of this white point right here. So I went out to the farmer, and I asked to see the point. He showed it to me. And then I said, well, do you have a collection from your farm? And he said, sure. And he brought out two cigar boxes full. And I went through every point, one by one, and I picked out five fluted point preforms out of stone from Indiana or Ohio. And I asked him, did that come from the same place where this base of this point did? And the man looked at me as if I were, uh, he was dumbfounded. He said, how on earth did you know that? And I said, they're all Clovis articles. To make the long story short, at the lamb site, we found a place where 18 artifacts there was a habitation material nearby, but there was one place where there were 18, almost well, surely were pristine artifacts. Many had been ruined by plowing, but they all lay in one small area. And they were all made of raw materials from somewhere else, including 
uh, Missouri and Dakotas and Indiana and Kentucky, and they all ended up in that one place. And the points were like peas in a pod in terms of their flaking qualities. Uh, I thought that they were the property, perhaps, of a single individual. And there they lay with his body, but the body is gone. Now maybe that's what Jason's point is. And if so, we're going to know immediately because we're going to find artifacts that are perfect, that may be made of exotic raw materials, and probably unbroken except perhaps by quality. So that proposition can be tested. And we can't say, we'll never be able to say for sure it's a burial, but it's a possibility because the bone will not be good. I want to pass this book around. This is the only copy of this book. Now, I sold my last two copies today. I, did, I printed 1,750 of this book. Uh, it's taken a good about 10 years to sell us. You see, scholarly publications, <laughs> they sell very slowly. But in any case, that's about a possible burial site. I've written other articles about that site. Uh, we we did find that there was a fluted knife in that cache. You know, cache is not the word to use. Really, deposit. Cash means implies that it's put in the ground or on a, a scaffolding or up in the crotch of a tree to be reclaimed at a, another day. But if it were burial material, it was never intended to be reclaimed. But the word cash has gotten, I mean, it's used a lot. It's bad English, you know. I'll call it a, a potential burial deposit. But cash, if I don't use the word cash, a lot of people in the mid-continent, well, they don't understand what I'm saying. So I have to use the word. Um, the third idea uh, is that it is part of a cache, something meant to be reclaimed, that was dug in the ground. And for reasons that are not apparent to us, it was never reclaimed. Now, the most famous cache that I have ever had a hand in digging is the Richie Clovis cache in an apple orchard out in central Washington state. For any of you who read National Geographic, go to the 1989 issue and you'll see an article entitled of Apples and Archaeology or something like that. Well, anyways, I finished that site off in 1990. I was present at the initial dig. And this was a cache, although people would make it into a burial who were politically motivated but it was no burial. It, there was no evidence of any human bone, and bone was preserved in that soil. There were limb bone artifacts of proboscideans or some large animal, uh, and uh, there were tooth marks of wolverines on the bones, and so we know that it was a deposit of artifacts, a true cache that had been put in the ground, but something happened and the people never came back to claim it. That why, you say, what happened to those people? Why didn't they reclaim this valuable property? Look at that poster that's on the table outside when you get a chance. There are the, the fluted bifaces from that cache, actual size shown, there were 50 some, 56 artifacts in that cache. Why would anyone leave such valuable property and never claim it again? In the valley, the Columbia River Valley, or in the Columbia River, we know that periodically there was something occurred known as a Jukelhaup. And that may mean nothing to you as German, but basically what it is is that you have these ice contact lakes in the Rockies. And when the waters get deep enough, the ice, which has dammed the valleys to make the lake, bobs upward all the water drains at once. 900 feet of water comes out of the mountains and rushes down the Columbia River Valley. And we know that the tidal front of water, in some cases, was up to 375 feet deep when it went through the valley. And then since the height of the last glaciation, there were at least 
48 yokel hubs. So if you were down by the river, you left your hunting equipment for the fall hunt high up in your site, you're down by the river and you see a yokel hub coming, kiss your wife goodbye <laughs> because you're gone. So maybe that's why they didn't get there. So if the third idea, the third hypothesis for Jason's point is correct, then there was a, a cache and a calamity, disease, uh, something took the people away. So if we excavate and we find something like the Richie Clovis cache, well, we'll know that's the correct idea. So it, that leads and brings us to the fourth hypothesis. And this would be by analogy to our own wonderful Sugarloaf site right here, just a few miles away, where we found a pristine javelin point in a workshop and it had been stepped on almost assuredly and had gone down in the sand and had been lost. True losses on archaeological sites, I would argue, are very rare. I dug a site, a huge Dalton site, on the banks of the Mississippi River. I put years of my life in it. We found more than 6,000 of these early projectile points, about 11,000 years old. We only found 40 that we felt were actual losses. They had fallen down in cracks or little crevices in the limestone, and we picked them out again. So actual losses by people, are, I think, are very, very few. Um, people think that they're commonplace, but when you look at most artifacts from an archaeological site, you'll find they're resharpened, they're broken, and have been rejected. But pristine, lost pieces, oh, very rare. So at Sugarloaf, we found this exquisite point. And it's out there as a cast for you to see. It's on exhibit uh, in the town hall uh, here in South Deerfield, the original. And uh, it's the only one we can say uh, that we found in our day uh, that was pristine. I'm sure it was missed and looked for. You know, if you go to the beach and you lose your keys in the sand, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, these four ideas I would put forth for Jason's point. And hopefully this fall, when the farmers allow us to go back and do our test pitting and the directly where he found the point, maybe we'll come up with the answer. But remember this, there always could be a fifth hypothesis which just doesn't come to my mind and it doesn't come to yours either. So be prepared for a surprise. I mean, I think we probably have most of the bases covered, but there's always that chance that there's something we just don't understand about behavior in that early period. Yes? I give you the fifth hypothesis. What is, what's that? I said I will give you the fifth hypothesis. Well, and, and would you, if you could uh, speak into the microphone, I sure would like to hear it. Well, after my break, as part of the presentation, I give the fifth. Oh, I see. Okay, you're going to give it to me this afternoon. <laughs> All right. I'm willing to wait. <laughs> it, it has to do with landscape change. All right. That's, that's wonderful. I, um, again, I'm open to suggestions, but you know the old saying, it's the testimony of the spade that counts. <laughs> yes, Craig. Mike, was the Jason's point? Yes. Was it uh, basally ground? I couldn't tell from looking at it. It looks... It's slightly basally ground. It's not heavily basically ground. That is correct. And yet, you know, it might not be an actual projectile point that could have served function or intended to be function as a knife. And as you know, most of the fluted knives that we find are, are seldom, if ever, ground on their bases, even on a Clovis site. 
So it, it, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know. But, but still, if it were a function that is a knife or a projectile point, it, 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 except for the kill site hypothesis, my favorite one, um, uh, the other three could still be an explanation. Yeah. Yes? Well, yeah, you know, I can't tell you how privileged we were at Sugarloaf to uncover partially. One of the rarest things I've ever encountered it was an actual workshop where artifacts were really finished, brought to completion. And based on the mapping that we have for the site, which is, could be improved, uh, we hypothesize there are six of these workshops, one for each band. The, the Sugarloaf site is structured as a big oval. It has a barren part in the center, the whole of the donut, if you will. It's like a squashed down donut. Then on the edge of that big hole are the workshops. And outside the workshops, on the periphery of the donut, if you will, are the habitation sites. And there are 36 of those. Six per workshop. Six was an important number. You know the Vail site had six loci. And we know they were all lived at simultaneously. To get back to this thing about the workshop. So as we began to dig this, and it became apparent that this was indeed a workshop where these objects were finished, I said to my friends, well, you know, now we're going to find out exactly what these people are making afresh all the time. Because many people believe that little Clovis points are just reworked versions, cut down versions of bigger ones. And that if you end up with little Clovis points, it's, it's not what was intended originally, okay? But people were making the best of a bad thing. Maybe the point broke, an impact fracture or something, and they reduce it. But when we dug this workshop, we found not only that there were large lance tips being made, but small javelin tips were being made from the fresh. So two kinds of projectile were being made. There was the proof of it simultaneously. But there was a third kind of fluted point being made as well in that workshop. And these were, they looked like projectile points, but the sides flared a little more. These are called St. Louis style fluted knives. And they are seldom ground heavily when they're used as knives. They're not projectiles. They do not have to be bound in and being tight, heavily ground on their bases. So we found some of those being made as well. So three kinds of fluted points were being made simultaneously. And to have a site that would tell us this and finally solve this old problem of understanding was unbelievable. It's, it's as good a wine as you're going to drink if you're an archaeologist interested in this period of time. So that's, did I answer your question? Thank you. Sorry, sorry it's a little discursive, but it needs a long answer. Yes. The Northampton Meadows is a rather large, broad, flat alluvial plain. Uh, and while rocks, while, while rocks don't flow, they do tumble. They can be flipped, especially of a plane. What about transport during flood to place that point in the meadows? I'm not sure where it was. If it's close to the river, there's a good chance. Well, that, I, I, I have no objection in adding that hypothesis to the list. We know of uh, uh, these uh, ice transported uh, pieces, boulders end up in peculiar places. This is not uncommon. I mean, well, it's, it's maybe you don't want to think that's what's happened, but it, I think it's, in, it's present in the geoarchaeological record a lot more commonly than people realize. Um, 
So yes, we can certainly, we'll add that. That's a fifth right there. Um, maybe there'll be a way to test that. Maybe there'll be no good way of testing it. Um, but we'll dig anyways. That's what we'll have to do. Yes? How do you date an isolated object like that? Is it by style? By style, but we don't need to rely on that anymore. I have to tell you, and most of you probably are not aware of the fact, that for certain raw materials, we can date them directly by uh, analyzing the amount of damage caused by radon-222. Radon-222, and radon is everywhere, uh, is, has a very uh, energetic alpha particle. I think it's four or five keV, and when it when radon in rainwater comes in contact with a flake stone artifact lying in the ground, um, it can begin to damage the artifact. And what happens is that uh, the, the electrons in some of the orbits are forced into a higher orbit and they accumulate. They have to have traps in which to accumulate. And if the rock is suitable, there'll be a lot of these electrons captured in traps. And when you stimulate that rock with an infrared laser, the electrons will fall back to a lower energy state and emit visible light, which you measure with a photomultiplier. And the amount of light is, is, depends upon the length of the period when the radon affected. It also depends on the concentration of the radon. So you obviously have to hold some things constant. But if you hold certain things constant, you can relatively date artifacts, and it's a wonderful technique. Um, uh, you must allow, though, if you really want to be very careful about it, you want to get a, a uh, you want to read the gamma radiation, the ambient gamma for radon-222. It has its own gamma ray signature, so you get a gamma ray detector, and you read it, and then you read it in another place that you can compare, you have to play a little game there. That's just a fine tuning, but that will improve your accuracy. But there is a method of dating directly in the rocks. It's in its infancy, but uh, yeah, I'll end up from the audience. Yes, please. What type of food supplies were you finding in Sugarloaf that people were eating maybe besides Mastodon. Were there fish? Were there other bones of smaller animals? Uh, we didn't find any mastodon there. All we found were servant, apparently servant uh, bones, and they were calcined. But in the uh, first dig that we did in 1995, Arthur Spees, who works in the state of Maine, uh, identified antlered servants. It's not very specific. That could be caribou, that could be elk. That could be deer, uh, you know, who knows what, what he meant by that, but that's the best he could do. And the bone that we found in 2013 was again, servant sized, but he can't be more specific. That's why we need to dig more in the sugar loaf site. We need to find more. All we're ever gonna find are these miserable, little calcined bone bits. And let's find more of them, because then we should be able to get some specific um, animal species, in other words. Right now, it can only be done to genus, and the genus is Cervidae. Yes? Mike, the John the front that asked the question about the Northampton Meadows uh, alluvial deposit. Yes? I think what he was asking indirectly was the meandering of the Connecticut River through the alluvial deposit, if that had taken place after the paleo establishment there, that the, that the paleo artifacts would have been scattered through the wind. So in other words, the meandering of the river happened prior to paleo man showing up on that floodplain? I, I don't pretend to know what the uh, succession of events is. You know, I know that it takes a local geologist who pays attention to terraces and so forth, and um, you know, I, I really don't, I can't answer that. I just would hold that out as a, possibility and, and add it as a fifth hypothesis. But, uh, frankly, I think it will be proved to be cultural. Uh, and, and culture is, you know, a lot of people hate to admit it, but uh, we human beings exercise a great deal of choice 
on what we do. We're not completely driven by economic or, shall we say, ecological necessities. Uh, we are ultimately, of course, we all live, we breathe air, we, we, the water, and so forth, but nonetheless, we have a fair amount of choice. And I think a lot of what we find in the archaeological record is more profitably analyzed in terms of culture uh, accounting for what is found than its physicality or geological events. Um, that's my take on it, anyways.